for having me. I, uh, I've been listening to your stuff for a while now. I know we've been trying to get this scheduled for a bit. Um, it's been a little tough with both of our work schedules and all that stuff, but I'm really glad to finally be on. I'm excited to talk with you. I think this should be a, a very good time. I think so. I, and I hate it that we didn't get to talk, you know, a month ago whenever we were doing the whole panfish month, but uh, I, it worked out better that we waited because I think a lot more has happened since then. And uh, your your life has taken some interesting turns. And I, I want to talk about it a little bit. Sure. Yeah. Um, I guess. But, go ahead. Before we do all of that, though, I guess I got to get some background information. Yep. Uh, you live in Wisconsin now, right? Yes. So Have you always lived there? No, I grew up in the sub suburbs of Chicago, about 45 minutes southwest of the city. Um, I moved up here to Wisconsin for college. I started school at <clears throat> a little private school, um, just North of Milwaukee called Concordia University, Wisconsin. Um, I ended up transferring from there to University of Wisconsin, Green Bay, which is where I graduated this past December. Oh, congratulations. What'd you, uh, what was your degree in? If you don't mind me asking. Yeah, no problem. Um, I studied marketing. Uh, okay. and then also did accounting. I was like a class or a one or two classes short for an accounting minor, but I was like, screw that. I'm trying to get out of college. We'll, uh, we'll pass. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my wife is an accountant and I don't see how she does it. Uh, it it's mind numbing work to me. Oh, some of it. I mean, I thought it was all that. I thought it was super cool, super fun. When I started out, you know, my principles of financial accounting class and, then I got into the heavy stuff. I was like, this is not, this is not the route I want to take. Um, so yeah, I start, I started with that, uh, ended up with my degree in marketing, um, which ultimately I think has kind of helped me, um, with kind of managing my social media and I guess creating my own brand as well as some others. Sure. We're going to talk about all that later. So we'll, we'll table that one for now. Cause that's yeah. a, that's an interesting discussion topic. Growing up in the suburbs, uh, whenever I was listening to you and uh, Al on his podcast, The Mindful Endeavors, uh, you had mentioned that you grew up fishing with your grandpa? Yes. Um, my grandpa, he is from Alabama. Um, so we only saw them, you know, once, maybe twice a year if we were lucky. Um, but every time he would take us out fishing, um, I have pictures of fishing with him ever since I was, you know, four years old with Velcro sneakers and holding the fish as big as my head. But um, he's to definitely the reason that I, I love fishing, um, the reason that I got into it. He was a big fisherman his whole life, did a bunch of freshwater, saltwater fishing, um, and he just wanted to pass it down. And um, so he taught me everything I knew as a kid. Um, we would fish for little panfish when I was younger, like, um, you know, just bluegill, crappie, little suckers, that kind of thing. Um, but then I moved, um, just like 20 minutes from where I grew up, we just relocated. Um, and there was a pond in our backyard in our new backyard that had, it still does have some pretty good sized bass in there. Um, <clears throat> so then we focused on bass fishing he kind of would still take us out all the time. I remember um, we didn't have a rod one time or my rod broke or something. And uh, we got some fishing line and a hook and he just tossed it out into the middle of the pond with a hot dog on it, left it out there for a couple hours. And I reeled in like an 18 inch bass, just hand lining it. Um, so all the crazy, um, I guess, crazy, I don't know the word for it. Um, attempts at fishing or the crazy kind of um, <laughs> vehicles that I use to catch fish. I guess I kind of learned from him. Um, thankfully, he's still here with us. So I send him all my fishing pictures and it makes it makes me happy. I can I really hope it makes him as happy as it makes me because um, without his guidance and all that, you know, I never would be the fisherman that I am today. And so he's the man. I really appreciate everything that he's done. That's what really interested me at first about, about your guys' discussion, because I, I share a very similar background. 
Okay. Uh, my grandpa was the one responsible for getting me outdoors. Mm -hmm. And I got to thinking about the way that he would fish versus the way that I fished. And it was completely different. He, he was the kind of guy that had infinite patience. So oh. he would stand in one spot at the pond with a bobber and a hook. And that's all he had. Yeah. And he would cast and cast and cast and cast. And he would catch fish all day. Right. In the meantime, I'd make five laps around the pond, you know, banging the edges, trying to get bass and stuff. And he never really said anything to me about it, but I think it made him a little bit antsy. And yeah. he always just wondered why I didn't stand right there and fish with him. Yeah. Was, was your grandpa that way or did he have a lot of different tactics he used? No, I, I, it's funny you mentioned that because one thing my grandpa, like to this day, will talk about with me is patience. And I was not a patient little kid when I would fish with him. I mean, if we weren't getting fish, I was ready to go to a different spot or, you know, target a different fish or do something else. Um, and he was always harping on just be patient, just be patient. And uh, so, yeah, I totally, I totally get that. It's funny that you say that because I think that I did have a very similar experience. You know, I guess as kids, you're kind of just like looking for that instant gratification when you're out there, you know, you just want to go out and have fun and catch a fish. But as you grow older, you know, that that's not always how it goes. So growing up in Alabama, what did he usually fish for? Was he, was he a multi-species guy or did he target pan fish and stuff? Yeah. So he actually grew up all across the country. His dad was in the army, so they moved all the time. Um, he did a lot of fishing in Alaska for a little bit. Um, he would target some trout out there while he was stationed there. Um, they were in all over the South as well. Um, he just, he did some bass fishing, but the main stories he would tell us um, were from his saltwater fishing experiences where he would catch you know, I I still remember <clears throat> a couple of the stories to this day about how he caught his like huge Jack um, Jack Creval. I'm not sure if it's it was that, but um, is there is there a fish called an amberjack? Is it yep, an amberjack? amberjack? Okay, yeah. So it was an amberjack. Um, he caught this giant one. He has a super old picture of it, but uh, then he would tell us stories about how he caught a 16 legged starfish one time and he had, has a picture of that as well, you know? And so we're always as kids, just like, Oh my gosh, this is so crazy. Um, but yeah, I think that most of the stories that he's told me have been from either just like Creek fishing for a little pan fish and trout or, um, saltwater fishing out and getting some huge fish. So, my grandpa never got the saltwater fish, uh, mostly because he didn't leave the county where he grew up in. Okay. Uh, he traveled for to go to church and things, but he lived basically within like a three mile radius of where he was born for his whole life. So wow. all the fishing stories I ever heard were like I knew the places intimately. Mm -hmm. And one of his favorite things to do was catching carp. I don't know why he liked them, but uh, they would go down the river and he would make homemade dough balls and he would yeah. cornflakes, vinegar, whatever it took, whatever he made. And he would, you know, pack bait around a hook and throw it out there. Plop. They would take them home and eat them. Yeah. <laughs> and I think they, my grandpa grew up in a time he was a depression baby. So they grew up where they had to eat just whatever they could. Right. And they, they lived on stuff like that and catching pan fish with him. If, if it was, I don't know, four inches, five inches long. That son of a gun was getting eaten like right now. <laughs> and, and it was more bone than it was fish, but yeah, he loved them. That's awesome. I, uh, that's, that is crazy. I mean, it's, I, I, I know a lot of people ever since I moved up to Wisconsin, I guess it's been a similar thing where people, you know, their family grew up here and they stay here and you know, this is just where they're established. Um, versus where I grew up, it was a lot of people moving around, coming from literally all over the world to live here. And, um, so I, I respect him for that. I think that that's really, really cool. Uh, right before he passed away, we, we had decided we were going to move and, uh, he was very, very upset that I was moving. I, I was the first one in our family to move out of the County. Oh, wow. Yeah. And he, uh, <laughs> one of the last things he said to me was, 
there, I don't think there's anything worse than breaking up a family. And oh. I thought, ouch, Papa, why you got to do that? That's bad. <laughs> but, you know, it, just different times. You know, he, he grew up in, in an era where family and was everything. If you didn't have each other, you, you were drowning. Yeah. Well, and so, uh, it's also different nowadays with, you know, how we can communicate with anybody wherever the heck we want, whenever we want, just at the push of a button. And, you know, that makes things quite a bit easier for us than it did or than it was back then. Um, because, you know, like you said, if you didn't have your family there, you were on your own. There wasn't anyone you could reach out to. Like you kind of had to just figure it out. And uh, so you, you moved away from your grandpa, right? Like out of, out of the suburbs into Wisconsin. Yeah. So my grandpa, they, he currently lives in Mississippi now, but my whole life he grew up, he lived in Alabama. Okay. Uh, so we, I moved from Plainfield, Illinois is where I grew up and went to high school. Um, I moved there or from there to Green Bay in May of 2019. So actually just about two years ago. About the um, same time I moved. So I got a job. At, I got a full-time internship. Um, mm -hmm. So it continued over summer and all that. So I figured, you know, I would move up here. And that's currently the job I have right now. I'm, I work as an IT auditor at, uh -huh. at um, Associated Bank in Green Bay. Um, so that internship and this job was kind of the main reason that I ended up coming up here. Um, I met my girlfriend in college as well. Um, she's originally from Green Bay. So it was a pretty easy decision for me to come up here and uh, to stay here. I absolutely love it here. Like it's so different than what I grew up doing. And there's so many different opportunities for outdoors and especially fishing activities. Like, I mean, I grew up pond hopping, you know, neighborhood ponds, fishing for largemouth and bluegill, and that's it. Um, but now, I mean, it's tough to come by like a decent largemouth spot around here. So mm -hmm. you have to target a bunch of different fish, which is so cool. Um, you know, I've like prior to coming here, I'd only ever caught like largemouth, bluegill, and a carp or two. Um, and now I've caught so many different species of fish up here just because they're accessible. And that's one of my favorite things about here is the change that I had to kind of, um, adapt to, I guess, kind of like mm -hmm. what you were talking about in one of your previous podcasts. I, I remember you asking the, I can't remember who it was with, but I remember you asking the guests about, you know, did you, you have to adjust to fishing in Colorado? Cause you were talking about moving, um, and how the fishing was a tough adjustment, but, it's been a, a cool one. That's for sure. I'm very upset that all I catch now is trout. Really? Oh my God. Whenever I lived in Ohio, <laughs> I, I thought about catching trout all the time. But now that I'm here, I'm like, man, I just want to catch something different. I'm tired of catching rainbow trout and brown trout. I want bass. <laughs> wow. Yes. Yeah. And, and I'm getting there. Uh, I, I've found a couple of spots where I can catch some, some decent bass. What I miss more than anything is my crappie fishing. I cannot find a good crappie spot here. Um, me and uh, actually a friend of mine that just came out in February, I think. Yeah, February. Uh, we had trout or uh, we had crappie dialed in in Ohio. Yeah. Now I, I can't catch them. I've caught one trout since I've been here in two years. And it was like a, a four inch crappie. And I was, I was disgusted. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. I, uh, in all honesty, I haven't caught a crappie since I went fishing with my grandpa as a kid. It's been probably 10, 12 years. I, um, it's been forever, and I really, really need to find some spots to get on them. I know there's some around here. I just don't have a boat or anything, so it's kind of tough to access the spots that I have heard are good, like just yeah. from the bank. So, um, yeah, I definitely need to get on some of those soon. The other tough thing, at least for me anyway, is just finding time to get out there. It seems like you're lucky enough that uh, your significant other enjoys going out with you all the time. Yeah, she, uh, maybe not all the time. I like to go as much as often, as much as I possibly can. Um, but 
I guess she kind of she grew up with um, in an outdoorsy type family. Her dad would and her her parents would take her camping. You know, as a kid, she would her dad would go hunting all the time. He would go fishing. They took her fishing as well. Um, so she's been around it for a while and kind of appreciates the outdoors. Um, and so when I really started to get back into fishing again, kind of when COVID started, um, I was like, Hey, we had a pond right at our old apartment and it was loaded. It's loaded with these little dinky bass. Um, <laughs> I mean, you can't catch anything bigger than probably a pound and a half in there. So uh -huh. I was like, all right, let's just go try it, you know, <clears throat> and that first, those first couple months, like April through like June, 2020, when we were like during prime COVID stuff and all that, she was kicking my butt fishing. I mean, I could not catch a fish in that pond and she was doing them in left and right. And that, so she loved it. She was, she would get so excited every time she had a fish on and she was catching them like crazy. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's awesome that she does like it. She gets very into it when she gets a fish. Her reactions are priceless. <laughs> um, <laughs> the other day we were fishing and she thought she had a bite and set the hook and set it into a snag and she was started reel and she's like, let's go. And then I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, oh boy, you got a snag. Um, but yeah, she's, she's the best. I love fishing with her. Um, it certainly makes it easier for me when I can say, Hey, you want to go fishing? And she's not like yelling at me about it. You know, it, it's, I can say, Hey, do you want to go with me? Do you want to go do this? And honestly, I guess in all seriousness, she's been super supportive about all this stuff I've been doing recently. I know it's taken a lot of time away from her, mm -hmm. um, but it, she's also really into, she, she gets excited when I catch crazy fish and all that. So, it's, it's awesome that she, um, that she likes to join me. I guess it's, it's a good, it's a very helpful thing. Well, absolutely. It's hard to go out and do something you enjoy whenever there's someone at home. That's, I don't want to say envious, but, uh, resentful that you go out and do those things. Yeah. I've been very lucky. You know, whenever me and my wife got together, she knew that I was an outdoorsman. Me, me and my grandpa went hunting all the time. We fished all the time. So, it's a part of me that she accepts since I've moved to Colorado. Uh, things have been a little different because everything's so much harder. You know, whenever I go hunting, I can't just go for a couple hours because it takes an hour to hike up to your hunting spot. Oh geez. Okay. Yeah. And, and by the time you get there, you're beat cause it's just yeah. climbing mountains. But I, I thought about that a lot after, after hearing you talk about that with Al, uh, how people do it that don't share that interest together. Yeah. You know, if you have a two people that just like one hates being outdoors and the other one loves it, is that compatible? I mean, are there strategies you can use to to satisfy each other's needs? I guess. Um, I I think so. Uh, ultimately, I guess this is going to get kind of, I guess, deep here, but uh, let's do it. I think in a relationship, ultimately, like. It, the love between the two of you is what's going to hold you together. And no matter what, like you go through much harder things than, you know, being pissed at your husband because he's out fishing when you he, you wanted him to be here doing X, Y, or Z, or, you know, getting mad at your wife because she's out, you know, with her friends getting her nails done or whatever the heck it is. Um, I It'll certainly make things tough. And I think it's just all about if you're willing to sacrifice that time or not because it, you know, it's something that makes the other very happy and it's something they love to do. You kind of either have to bite the bullet a little bit and just say, all right, yeah, I'll join you. Or, you know, let's go try this out. I think kind of showing some interest into, you know, even if you have absolutely zero interest in what they're doing and you would rather be doing anything else, showing interest there and kind of you know, supporting them in that it, it helps a lot. And that would help show them that you care and that, you, you know, you're kind of, you're there to support them. And ultimately I think you can get through it. I don't think that, I mean, coming out of college, I'm still, I'm still young. Like my girlfriend and I have been together for about three years now, but you know, I, 
I feel like I've learned a lot in this relationship compared to like previous ones I've had. And, you know, a lot of kids in college and stuff, it's a bunch of immature, stupid relationships that are not based off of, you know, actually loving one another. And it's just based off of looks or it's just, you know, to have a girlfriend or to have a boyfriend. Um, so I think that the more, if you take a mature approach to it and you have a, a mature relationship, you can figure it out. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't doubt that. I've had to make compromises. So my wife loves the kayak, okay. but she doesn't like to fish. Uh, hmm. I've had to make my trips a lot shorter. So we'll go out to a little reservoir. We'll paddle around it a couple of times. And when she's ready to leave, it's one of those things where it's like, okay, I got to suck it up. I got to leave because I don't want to burn her out. Right. And then after I get her home and she takes a nap, then I can head back out and do my thing. <laughs> yeah. It's just, it's just tough though. It's tough to set aside your personal wants. Cause I'm sure, I mean, if you, if you like fishing as much as I do, you could spend daylight to dark fishing somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know about your significant other. My wife cannot do that. She would kill me. Yeah. Um, it's funny you say that, you know, you have to cut it short because that's what I have to do a lot of times here. You know, I would honestly a hundred percent rather have her come out with me and go out for, you know, 30, 45 minutes until she's like, all right, screw it. I'm done. I haven't caught a fish or I'm bored or whatever. I would much rather, have that time with her to be honest than being able to go out for you know two three hours on my own um i'm i'm a very social person person i crave human interactions and i don't like doing stuff alone in general so it's always better and more enjoyable for me when she's there but i agree we definitely have to plan around those and i when i plan them i'm like all right we'll be there for an hour max you know and <laughs> or, but if it's just me, you know, I can go out with my buddies for hours and hours and hours. It's funny you brought that up because when I was listening to your podcast with Al, you were talking about how fishing, especially during COVID, kind of helped you cope with a lot of things. And one of the things that interested me was, like, if I remember correctly, you were a little bit stressed about driving really far to go fishing. So you had to incrementally work your way farther away from the house. Yeah. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. And I appreciate you listening to that podcast. Um, it was, it was a ton of fun, but, uh, yeah. So basically I'll give you just a little bit of background for everybody listening. Um, I have struggled with anxiety and depression my whole life more on the anxiety side. Um, and when COVID hit kind of, I've never really been comfortable traveling period. Um, it, I always, it, that's just something that makes me very anxious, especially if it's far travels like across the country or something like that. Flying, I don't do flying. <laughs> I, uh, I've done it plenty of times before I've flown to Europe before, but like, I just, I hate it and I avoid it at all costs. Um, but traveling is just something that's given me a lot of anxiety throughout my life. And when COVID hit, I had the opportunity to start working from home and to start school from home and to, you know, I will never go out to do anything. Everything's closed. Nobody wants to hang out and see each other. So I got very used to just sitting in my house and, you know, doing nothing all day long except my work and just hanging out there. Um, so I realized this towards the end of this past summer that something was off and I guess wrong. You know, I was, I couldn't even go drive like my girlfriend and I went on a camping trip and this is this isn't something I've told many people because it's like I feel really I felt super embarrassed about it at the time you know we <clears throat> went out on a camping trip we were all super excited about it you know telling all our friends and then I I, I started to have some panic attacks and I ended up you know throwing up and it was a disaster so we left like before we even stayed the night. Um, and that was when I was like, you, you got to stop ruining this stuff for, for you and for her because we were super excited about it. And I, uh, so I guess fishing has given me something to kind of put at the end of that trip, you know, 
if I, if I'm going 30 minutes, I get to go fish right after, you know, I'm excited to get there and I'm not worried about the process of getting there. Um, and so, like I said, with Al, um, I kind of started, you know, let's go 30 minutes away. Let's go an hour away. You know, let's go back home for like, that's like a three and a half hour trip. Um, and even when I would go back home, I was still, I still noticed, you know, anxiety and stuff. And I was like, this, this kind of sucks to be honest. Like it, it, it was hard because not even being comfortable to go to your own parents' home, like that was tough. But, um, it, fishing has helped me a lot because like I said, it kind of gives you a light at the end of the tunnel type thing. Um, where I can, like I said, look forward to whatever I'm going to, um, wh wherever I'm going, I guess. Like, so now, you know, I have a bunch of trips planned. <clears throat> well, in my head, they're not on paper yet, <laughs> but I have a bunch of trips planned this summer across Wisconsin, hopefully to Minnesota. Um, gosh, I mean, even if, if I'm feeling crazy or up to it, we'll see, maybe make it out farther somewhere, Texas, Florida, we'll see. Um, but yeah, fishing and the outdoors are just kind of like an escape for me. Like you all day long, you know, you sit there and you're working and you're dealing with people, you're dealing with your family, you're dealing with your own personal issues. And when I go fishing, I can just focus on fishing. I can focus on like the littlest things, like what color am I going to throw right now? Because the water is stained compared to what it was, you know, two days ago. Um, so I think that it's just kind of a coping mechanism, I guess, with that, with, to deal with my anxiety. Um, it's super helpful. I mean, I, it's not a one size fits all solution for everybody, but it's certainly something that I have found helps me a lot. I can sympathize with the anxiety stuff because, uh, my wife has some anxiety issues and on our first trip out here to Colorado, we did a, a two week road trip okay. and we were the same as you. We were pumped all the way up to it. We were going to camp out in the Rockies. It was going to be a great trip, but we didn't really plan any of it. We didn't plan our stops. We were just going to drive. And whenever we wanted to stop, we'd stop. Right. After about day two, she had crippling anxiety issues. And for her, the rest of the trip was really hard. Yeah. She really struggled with it. So I, I sympathize on that front. And the whole reason I started the podcast is because I was starting to suffer. Okay. We moved, COVID hit, everything locked down. Yeah. And I could feel myself getting anxious. I was in the house all the time. And I'm like you, I'm a social creature. Right. Um, I had a four year at the time, a three year old and a five year old that were, you know, daylight to dark up yeah. my rear end. And I constantly had to look after their needs and I didn't have any time to look after myself. Right. And it got to a point where I was like, I don't even really recognize who I am anymore. I'm just, I'm being suffocated under this. Mm. And, and the podcast, thank goodness has helped me release some of that. But it's, it's interesting that you said you're a social creature and you have anxiety because usually those two things don't go hand in hand. Yeah. Um, it's, it's different, I guess. You know, my, <clears throat> ultimate, throughout the years of kind of analyzing myself, talking with doctors, counselors, psychologists, all of these people, you know, about why this is happening and how I can fix it, um, I've kind of realized my anxiety stems from situations in which I have low to no control over. Um, like one thing, I I don't I don't drive with other people. I always drive. I do not. Tr I just I can't do that. It, it makes me so nervous. I have zero control of what's going on. I absolutely hate it. Like, even if it's a, someone offering to drive like five hours, you know, for me, I'm just like, nope, <laughs> you know, I will do this. I'll pay for my own gas. I don't care. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where my anxiety stems from is the lack of control over a situation. Um, and I've never really had issues with, you know, speaking to people or interacting with people. Like I said, I absolutely love it. Um, but like my brother, on the other hand, he has some similar issues, but his are just the opposite. He has, 
he's super, super smart. You know, he can do, he can travel, he can do all that kind of stuff that I struggle with, but he struggles very, very heavily with social interaction. Um, and so it's, it's weird because like a, a year or so ago, we, mm -hmm. we got put on the same anxiety medicine. I had been taking it for a while and it, it helps. I still take it now. It helps me so much. Um, but it, it ruined his life <clears throat> for the time he was taking it. It well, he was miserable. He was sick. He was anxious all the time. And so it just really goes to show how different everybody's situations can be with a very generalized, I guess, disorder, mm -hmm. if, if you will. Um, because ultimately it's, you know, your brain is just wired differently and it is what it is. You know, I, I don't like to see it anymore as like an official disability or a disorder or something that's wrong with me, you know? I think that it's just it's just a part of me and it's just a challenge that I have to overcome every day and I have to deal with it and I have to make the best of it. But like having anxiety has made me a much more empathetic person for others in this similar situation. And I mean, it's it's not good, I guess, but there's a lot of good that has come out of it. And um but yeah, I guess circling back to your original question, um, I've never had issues with speaking or interacting with people. And it's just because anxiety is different for everybody. And, you know, I, like I said, with, with Alex, it was, you know, so the, the craziest things can set somebody off, you know, whether you are just, whether your car is messy or your room's messy, that could just completely ruin your day or, you know, something's out of place or a plan gets canceled or whatever. Um, it's just different for everybody. There's no one size fits all solution, but um, I think that it, I don't know, everybody that suffers or deals with it, it can kind of relate. And I think that it's something that people can ultimately use to their advantage if they kind of if they work on it and try. I think it's great that you talk about it and acknowledge it. Uh, it's, it's not anything to be embarrassed about. It's, it's just something like you said, you, it's a, it's a goal to overcome an obstacle to overcome. Right. Um, how long did you, I don't, I don't want to say suffer with anxiety, but how long, how long did you go through having, having this anxious feeling before you actually went and talked to somebody? <laughs> and the only reason I ask is because I recently did a podcast with a, a gentleman that, runs uh, all male fishing guided trips okay. and it's, it's, it's wilderness therapy. So they, they get this group of guys together that are by all accounts, successful people, but they're mm -hmm. afraid to talk about their mental issues. There's right. a, there's a sort of stigma around men's mental health. Yep. And he said that, you know, typically a man will go at least 10 to 12 years suffering with whatever's wrong with them before they ever think about talking to somebody. Yeah. I, that's very true. And there, I, I'm not a fan at all of the stigma around the negative stigma around men dealing with mental health issues. I mean, so in my case, I was kind of lucky, um, without going into too much detail of craziness. Um, my parents got divorced when I was six. Um, it was not a pretty divorce on any account. Um, so, and that's when I, I kind of started showing anxiety initially. I was a kid and my mom sent me to a counselor. So I would, I saw probably 10 or 15 different counselors by, from like six to 18 um, while I was there in high school, like up through high school. But I, in high school, I stopped. And I was like, screw this. Like, I'm fine. I know I'm okay. I can do everything I want to do and I'll be all right. <clears throat> um, but it was actually three, four years, four years ago now, um, just almost to the day. Um, I was having 
it was just a really, really bad time for me. I was struggling really, really, really bad with anxiety. I was having panic attacks that would cause me to like black out. I would have multiple of those a day. I would throw up. I would, you know, make myself sick, freak out, leave school, you know. Um, and one morning I was driving to school and I had a panic attack, blacked out and crashed my car. Um, luckily nobody got hurt. I didn't, we, it was just, uh, the car got damaged, but that was kind of when I was like, all right, you got to figure this out because this is, this is really not, not good at all. Like you're afraid of going to school as a senior in high school and you've not been afraid to go to school, you know, since you were five. And so then I, my ex-girlfriend at the time, she was like, look, you might have anxiety. Like you should probably just check this out. You know, this isn't normal for people to be, you know, normal for people to be acting like this. And you're kind of like, you're acting weird. You're doing this and that. So just get it checked out. And I was like, no, 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 I don't have anxiety. I dealt with that when I was a kid, I'm fine. Um, but up until that crash, I, I actually ended up in the ER that day because I had just nonstop panic attacks, throwing up. I just, I couldn't, I couldn't control myself. I had no idea what was going on. Um, so that was kind of when I took it upon myself to actually get better. Um, ever since then, I have been on and off talking with people kind of as needed. Um, recently, a couple months ago, I, my anxiety started to get really, really bad again. Um, and so I have been talking with a counselor and I mean, I'm not afraid to say that like people might think, you know, if you're going to a doctor or a psychiatrist or whatever, you're crazy or you need help, like you need mental help and you're all messed up. But it's, I mean, I do it so that I can control my life and live a life I want to live. Um, it's not anything to be ashamed of. I mean, that's what they're there for. And that's what I, I hate that people discourage, you know, especially men from talking about their feelings. And, you know, I have in the last couple of years, I've talked with a ton of my friends who have said, Oh yeah, I've actually been dealing with this as well. Like in college, I was very open about it to a lot of people because they would see me taking my medicine before bed every night, you know, and they, Oh, what's this? So, um, a lot more people than think deal with similar stuff like that. And there's no reason you should feel scared or anything to reach out scared, nervous, embarrassed. Like there's no, no reason at all. I mean, it affects so many people and it's, it's just, you know, I mean, it's just like any other thing, like people, everybody has their baggage. Everybody has, their issues that they deal with, but it's nothing different than, you know, if someone, I don't know, had like a physical, like a physical disability or a learning disability or anything like that. Like you don't treat them like pieces of crap when they talk about it or get help. Like you don't make fun of them. You, but there's a trend to kind of make fun of people that are talking about mental health and stuff. And it's not, I don't think that's, appropriate it's not it's certainly not helpful that's for sure and well, it, no it, way and uh, the benefit of talking to a psychologist psychiatrist other than the fact that it's someone that's trained that can help you work through all these problems for me it's you're talking to someone that is disassociated from your life yeah and they, they can offer you a completely different perspective so if i'm having a bad day i can call and talk to my mom i know exactly what my mom is going to say to me well, the first thing she's going to say is you need to move back home. <laughs> but after that, I know I know the train of thought and it doesn't really help me any. Right. I could talk to my wife, but I know what she's going to say. Yeah. You go and see someone that has nothing to do with your life at all. And they can just they can say a few things and you go, oh, well, I didn't look at it that way. Simple as that. And yeah. then when you then when you couple that with, you know, an activity you enjoy, such as fishing you mentioned that you know doing those types of activities gives your brain just a second of just rest where you're not focusing on your the daily crush of life 
you're focusing on what collar or jig to throw. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And, it, and it's easy. Same thing with hiking in the woods, you know, whenever I was going hunting. Yep. When you're huffing and puffing at 9,000 feet and your fat ass is out of shape, you're not <laughs> thinking about the daily grind. You're yeah. thinking about how you're going to get off that mountain if you shoot a deer. Yeah. I Gosh, I wanted to ask you about that. Um, you mentioned the elevation change. I, in a previous podcast, personally, I think that would be a huge pain for me. I think that would be super tough to deal with. How was that with you, for you? I didn't suffer too bad. Now, I haven't been super high up. You know, there are some 14,000 foot peaks here. Okay. I haven't been up there. And I'm sure that'd be a lot different than where I'm at now. <laughs> but I went from basically sea level to the city I live in now is about 5,000 feet above sea level. Oh, wow. Um, that was a little bit of a change. You know, uh, walking up and down stairs, what you'd notice yourself getting out of breath. Uh, mostly the biggest struggle has been just the the steepness of elevation change. So some of the places I hike, you know, within a couple miles, they gain a couple thousand feet. Wow. Yeah, it's brutal and it That's gets hot and it's, I don't know, it's just, it's tough to deal with. It's a completely different surrounding than what I was in Ohio. Sure. And I was in the hilly part of Ohio, but wow. we had hills. They weren't mountains. Yeah. These things don't end. I mean, you start walking up them, you're like, okay, I got to, <laughs> I got to be close. And you look at your, uh, your map and you go, Oh God, I'm not even halfway. <laughs> That's nuts. Yeah. I haven't done myself any favors. So, uh, if you ever want to come out here and hunt, first of all, let me know, we'll do something. Second of all, uh, train, you got to get in shape. Uh, wearing the masks everywhere has helped me a little bit. I notice now that if I take my mask off, I can do a lot more physical activity, a lot better. Gotcha. Um, but just walk and walk and walk and walk, throw weight in a backpack and walk and walk and walk, do lunges, do squats. Cause that hiking here is all legs and lungs. Yeah. Cause you're not using, you're not climbing. You're not doing upper body stuff. Sure. You're just walking your ass off trying to get to the top of a mountain. Yeah. That's crazy. Uh, and last year was my first experience with it and I was not ready. I didn't do myself any favors. I was not physically ready. I wasn't mentally ready. I wasn't good enough with my bow to be ready. Okay. Uh, it was a big learning experience. This year, completely different ball game. I've got a gun, so I don't have to be nearly as sneaky. Uh, and I've got a nice neighbor. My neighbor's going to help me out, load some bullets. We're going to go hunting together. Awesome. I'm, I'm going to put some meat in the freezer this year for sure. Awesome. That, that's very exciting. What are you going to target? Uh, mule deer is what I got my tag for. Nice. Uh, now, I don't have a tag yet. I'm waiting for the draw to come back. Sure. Um, I don't know if you know much about big game hunting out here, but it's a lottery system. Yeah. There's similar systems for like bears and wolves in Wisconsin. So yeah, you know all about it. Yeah. I should be hearing back anytime soon. Uh, hopefully, hopefully I get something. I put in for an elk tag for bow, but that's mostly just to get a preference point. Cause I know I'm not going to get the unit. Okay. And if I do, it'll be a freaking fluke of nature. <laughs> it's just the way it'll work. So we'll see. Uh, I've got a I've got a week to deer hunt in, and uh, I'll if I have to, I'll take off work and take the kids with me. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I going on to some new news for you. You just before we started, I had no idea about this. You you put up an Instagram post about something new you're doing. It really ties in really well with the whole discussion we just had with mental health. Uh, yep. You want to talk about that a minute? Yeah, I would love to. Um, thank you for bringing that up. I appreciate it. Um, but basically, I guess <clears throat> a little bit about a little bit more background. I started my outdoors Instagram account um, a couple months ago. Uh, I have seen an absurd amount of support that I have never, I never, ever, ever would have imagined when I started it, and. Um, I kind of just came across this guy's account through a mutual Instagram friend who reposted something. And I was like, Oh, this is, this is really cool. Um, so I checked it out and what it's called is it's called day one ambition. Um, and basically this guy, his name is Brandarius Johnson. He lives out in Nevada, out in Las Vegas. Um, <clears throat> amazing, amazing dude. He, he just reached out to me when I followed, you know, he, we were, 
we got to talking and uh, we were talking about school, kind of like what I did um, in college, what he did in college, that kind of thing. Um, and I told him I did marketing and he was like, oh, no way. That's kind of crazy because I'm, I'm looking for somebody to help me out with marketing for this company. And I was like, well, this is this is really cool because the company, what he does is something I'm extremely, extremely passionate about. Um, he the day one ambition is all about um, advocating for mental health um, and suicide awareness. Um, Brandarius started this company in 2014 after his girlfriend at the time killed herself. Um, so he's been very personally affected by this. Um, and I was, I was stoked to have him, you know, just reach out and talk. Um, we were talking a little bit about it and he just kind of offered me to help out. And I was like, absolutely. I said, absolutely. You know, it's, I, I would love to help out in any way I can. And it's kind of turned into more than just helping him out here and there and promoting his stuff. But, um, it's really just all about, like Al says, keeping the conversation going, um, getting rid of that stigma against mental health issues and kind of, you know, helping people out in how, whatever way you can. Um, he has done, he's famous for his 100 mile run for mental, for suicide awareness that he did um, a couple, I think it was a year or so ago. Um, you know, that, that got televised and everything around there. So he's actually building up a pretty good, pretty big brand. Um, it's, it's really, really cool. He does a bunch of like speaking events where he'll go to schools or, you know, wherever the heck they want him to go. And he'll talk about mental health and all that fun stuff. But it's, it's super, super cool. Um, it's, it's the best thing I've done with my account so far. That for sure i'm i'm so excited about it and i mean when i posted it <clears throat> today i was like ah you know there's no fish there's nothing outside it's just a picture of my girlfriend and i and i was like i'm probably gonna get you know less likes than average less engagement than average but this is a cool thing so i wish i so that kind of sucks i wish i had you know i was hoping it would do better but as soon as i post it people are just going crazy about it and I think that really shows the power of, you know, his movement and how amazing this truly is because I don't know, I guess it's not a common thing for people to be talking about, you know, on their fishing Instagram or whatever. Um, a lot of people don't see that stuff. And I think that we can, one of my goals with this is to kind of reach a whole different, um, I guess, gosh, what's the word? Um, a different audience? Yes, another audience, another group of people um, that his brand might not have reached initially. Um, and that's kind of what I want to do with this. And I want to, you know, just ultimately spread awareness. I'm not trying to make a crap ton of money with him. Like, in fact, I'm making zero money. <laughs> you know, like, it's not it's not something I'm doing because it's going to make me rich or it's going to make me, you know, super popular and famous. It's, I'm just, I was given the opportunity and I can't really, I can't pass it up. I'm so excited to, I guess we're in the works. I kind of drafted a project proposal for him recently about something I could put on around here. Um, like a little event type thing. Um, so we'll see. I think I'm actually going to do that this summer once it gets a little nicer out here. Um, I guess I'll give you a, I'll give you a little inside scoop. It's nothing crazy, but, um, 12 hike inside scoop. I love it. <laughs> so I, I called it, I call it the hike for hope. Um, and it, I just basically want to put on a little event like a, we'll go to, you know, a state park or something in Wisconsin around here. I'll get, friends, family, anyone that's actually interested in coming. Um, and we will just do, you know, a little hike for um, awareness. And that combines kind of my love for the outdoors. Um, we'll do, you know, speaking and 
I'm not sure. We'll we'll do a probably open up uh, like a Zoom <clears throat> or something like that, so we can have people from if they can't physically make it, they can at least listen into the meat of the event, <clears throat> which is going to be him, Brandarius, and I talking about you know mental health issues and all that fun, all that craziness. But uh, yeah, I mean. It's super, super awesome. I I cannot thank him enough for giving me this opportunity and just, you know, it's like I said, it's the best thing I've done with my account so far. I, I The support I've seen just on this post is nuts. I mean, people are so happy about it and they think it's so cool. And I mean, I really hope that I can help kind of make that attitude towards mental health a more common one mm -hmm. you know people that are looking at it like oh holy crap like what is this kid doing like really that's not that has nothing to do with fishing i don't want to <laughs> say that crap but uh i think that's kind of the weird thing about instagram so you see so many pictures and so many profiles that are all about the likes that's all they care about they're they're doing the stereotypical mountaintop picture or the big fish picture holding it way out in front of them <laughs> with some kind of motivational caption underneath it and they're tagging all these companies and stuff. Right. What you're doing with Brandarius is is a genuine, like from the heart thing you care about. Yeah. And that's what's going to make it successful. You're not doing it because you want to get a bunch of Instagram likes. You're doing it because you want to help people. Right. And I guess that <laughs> When I started my account, I was, you know, I had zero expectations. I was, you know, I just wanted a place to post my fishing and hunting pictures just for fun, you know, and talk with people that have similar interests. Um, and then I kind of got caught up in all the hype about, you know, you get pro staff for this company and pro staff for that company. And you need, you know, you work with this huge company. And so I kind of went down that road initially because I thought that's what was going to propel me and get me followers and all that. Um, but I guess recently in the past couple of weeks or so a month, um, I have been, I kind of rethought through, I was like, you know, this is not why I did this. I didn't start this to become rich and famous. Like I just started to kind of have some fun and, you know, make some new friends and man, I have made so many new friends through this. Holy cow. It's amazing. Um, Instagram is one of those weird things, technology in general. So it has the ability to bring people together. Like I've talked to you, Al, I've talked to people in Canada, mm -hmm. people that I never would have ever had the chance to talk to before. But at the same time, you can have families at a dinner table that don't talk to each other because they're on their phones all the time. Right. Is, is that a net negative or a net positive? I don't know. Um, I think that that's a very, very, very good point. And that's something that you see all the time now. Like you'll go out to dinner and there will be four people at a table all just, you know, their phones in their faces, you know, they'll eat and they'll leave. But, <clears throat> and I, I admit, I do that. I do that stuff all the time, especially, you know, with, with this account now, I get a bazillion notifications all day. I'm always on it because I want to know what's going on. Um, and that was something I kind of realized recently it relates back to my anxiety, why I'm always checking my phone. Because like I said, I want control. I want to know what's happening. And so I'm always, you know, I have my phone on me 24 seven. My girlfriend yells at me about it all the time. <laughs> so, um, but I mean, it does afford you the opportunity to connect with people like that you never, ever, ever would have. But then again, you know, it can also take away from the relationships that you have already. They're your close familial relationships, your friends, whatever. Um, you know, my girlfriend will yell at me, stop paying attention to your phone and pay attention to me, you know? And so um, it's, I don't know. Ultimately, I think that it's a good thing. I think that there are a lot of benefits. I just think people use it the wrong way a lot. And, you know, it's tough whenever I started an Instagram page and the whole 12 like thing, you know, my plan was to try to grow the brand and, and make it something I wasn't, I knew I wasn't going to make money, but I still, it, it needs a base 
to grow from. Right. So I spent a lot of time obsessing over statistics and analyst analytics and trying to get as much content out as possible. And boy, let me tell you, it can wreck the way you think about life because I was like you, I had my phone on me all the time, just trying to, you know, update, see how many likes I've got, how many downloads do I have? It'll suck the life out of you. And yeah. it got to the point where I had to stop and go, okay, th this is obsessive. It's a little too yeah. much and start scheduling time with my phone. Sure. So, you know, take an hour out of the day and you yeah. schedule all your posts, check all your updates. And then once that hour is done, you put your phone down and walk away from it. Yeah. It's tough as shit to do, but uh, it, it's an effective way to cope with it. So it doesn't become overwhelming because it was, it was becoming overwhelming for me. Yeah, it certainly can. I mean, gosh, like I, I was talking with my girlfriend about this earlier today. Um, you know, one of my points that I try to make on my account is that I'm, I'm going to respond to every single comment. I'm going to respond to every message. Anyone that ever wants to talk, I'm going to talk to them. Um, you know, because that's something you don't see. I mean, I'm nowhere near famous. I'm definitely not a super huge Instagram influencer by any means, but you're three times more famous than me. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. I don't know about that. I don't, I don't have a podcast. <laughs> you will soon keep it up. <laughs> but, um, I, I guess like some people, you know, like the super famous celebrities, they will never respond to anything. They won't like comments. They won't respond to DMs. They they don't give two shits about, you know, responding to some random person across the country, you know, or across the freaking world. And I think that's kind of upsetting because they were once those people, you know, they just happened to have some great content. They worked their butts off and, you know, they got famous and they got rich, but I think I hate when people don't stay humble and forget their roots because, and that's one thing I try to do all the time is just, I, I, I try to stay humble and no matter how, you know, if I get 500 likes on a post or whatever, if, or 200 likes or, you know, it's just, I just appreciate the heck out of it. I, I love every single person that supports my account. It's just nuts <laughs> that these people want to watch this idiot up in Wisconsin and try to catch fish. <laughs> like I, I just cannot believe it, but man, like, like you said, I'm trying to kind of be unique and build my own path in that way where I'm not doing this for the likes and for the fame and for the money. And I really, I mean, I'm trying my best. I think that I'm, I'm doing a decent job, I guess, but um, I, I, I really, I really value other people's opinions and other people's time. I know they took time out of their day to comment on my stuff, to like my stuff. Um, and if they want to talk with me about it, I'll talk with them about it. Like there's no problem at all there. So, I mean, it's social media is tough. It certainly can, you know, have negative, many, many, many negative effects, but I guess if you're in it for the right reasons and you kind of balance it out with your life, which is, also tough. Um, I think ultimately it'll be a positive. Um, and that's what I'm hoping to do with my account. You might as well tell everybody what your account is while we're talking about it. Sure. So it's just, it's EDC dot outdoors, just my initials. Um, <clears throat> my person. And, and what's the account of the, uh, the mental health? Oh, it's at, at day one ambition. Okay. Um, no spaces or anything crazy. Um, but yeah, that's, if you, uh, if anyone ever wants to talk about anything, I'm, uh, I'm always, like I said, I'm always on my phone looking for a conversation. So I'm going to send my co-host your way to talk about all the drum you're catching. I'm sure he'd like to get some tips. Oh my goodness. They're huge here. <clears throat> uh, They're gigantic. Yeah. He about killed me catching a drum one time. So I'm a little, uh, really? I don't like him. Yeah. Yeah. We were fishing in the middle of a thunderstorm and oh. that idiot catches a drum and it takes him a half hour to land it. And I'm just standing <laughs> in the middle of this Creek with a nine foot fly rod, just a, just a lightning rod right, waiting to get struck. So I ruined his crankbait for it and got him the hell out of the river. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Evan, I appreciate your time talking to me today. No problem. I, I really enjoyed this. This was, this was a lot of fun. Um, 
thank you very much for having me on. I hope hopefully I'll be back in the future. I would love to, I would love to join again. This was a really good time. And uh, thank you for taking some time out of your day to talk with me and kind of let me share my story. I appreciate it. No problem. Get with, uh, get with day one ambition and we'll, uh, we'll do a little something later. Yes. He, I think that would be great. He would love to, I think he's going to be on Al's podcast soon. So I, uh, I would love to do that. That would be a ton of fun. I'll definitely put that on his radar. Sounds good to me, man. Awesome. Appreciate it, Evan. Yeah, thank you, Zach. It was a good time. I appreciate it. Yep.